Good morning. I want to welcome you to the Roy Branson Legacy Sabbath School. And I'm over here today because the camera's shooting here, and for some reason they wanted me in this too. So, uh, uh, and they didn't even talk to my agent ahead of time. So, anyway, uh, seriously, we want to welcome you today. Uh, today we're going to have the second part of Dr. Bradley Nelson's discussion of what he does in Africa. And just you'll notice that the cameras are a little different today. Uh, they're, let's say Bradley's going to have this done, and then they're going to edit it before we put it online because of some of the sensitivity of the issue. And so, uh, anyway, uh, next week we have the learned Bernard Brandstatter going to speak on Vanatu, uh, some of the mission Vanatu. work. Uh, and if you're going to miss the time, the 10th of August, that's when I'm going to be speaking. I'm going to be using uh, Nick Miller's book on religious freedom in the United States at the uh, Constitution, at the start of the Constitution. And I was interested in it because I see that the book is published by Oxford <coughs> Press. And I figure anybody that gets a book published on Oxford <coughs> Press worth something. He also graduated from Notre Dame University. Not the one in Paris, but the one in South Bend. And then Gary Chartier is going to be here on the 17th. And then t the 24th, we're going to have Dr. Ron Osborne, who has been here before, who is now at La Sierra University. And he's going to be speaking on humanism and the death of God. So uh, we're filled up through August. So uh, again, want to welcome you. And I want to welcome. You can turn that microphone on now. It's on. It's on, okay. And again, this is Dr. Bradley Nelson. You're a graduate of this August institution. Yes. You were build You helped build this building, I think. In a way. I yeah. rode the motorcycle through the foundations, <laughs> yeah, of okay. the old one. Yeah. Okay. And you, um, you've had your practice, and you've also taught here at the university? In All of that, but most of my life was spent in Africa running bush hospitals from Malamula to Muami to Yuka to Muganero and uh, Harry Hospital and then came back here, taught on the faculty, and then went into emergency medicine, from which I retired nine years ago. And so you're actually retired and doing nothing, just sitting around the house. I'll tell you about that <laughs> just in a minute. Yeah. <laughs> okay, anyway, so he was here two weeks ago, uh, and we are gonna have time for you to ask questions today. And so without any further ado, as they say, I'm turning it over to you. And do you wanna have the prayer, or you want me to have a prayer? I would love to, okay. thank you. Heavenly Father, here we are once again on your beautiful Sabbath day. We want to praise you as the creator and the one who invites us into your inner sanctum of thought to suffer with your children and go through your suffering and finally become more like Christ through patience and through mercy. And we thank you now that we can share a very difficult problem and discuss it and the ramifications of it and help us to see the mind of Christ all the time both in this presentation and in our lives. I thank you. In the dear name of Jesus, amen. Last time we started out and talked for some time about the four problems of oppression that I've been working against all my career, having said that in particular the last two years in the western part of Kenya amongst the Maasai people on the border of Maasai Mara Game Park. In fact, the camp overlooks the Maasai Mara and at night you can hear the lions roaring in the park, zebras running in the campground, and these friendly guys, we have about 60 of them on campus. And I challenged last time anybody to count the number of giraffes in this. Well, you got nine? Anyway, it's a lot of them, and they hide well, and they are out all the time roaming around the camp. It's very, very natural and beautiful. I got eight, so that's very good. Maybe there's an extra one. Now, I like this picture because it's right after a huge rainstorm in which there was thunder, lightning, and big columnless clouds. And at the top of that formed this rainbow in ways that I had never seen before. It really looks like the throne of God to me as he talks to us. 
But if anyone causes one of these little ones who believe in me to stumble, it would be better for him to have a large millstone hung around his neck and to be drowned in the depths of the sea. You hardly ever hear Christ speaking in such stern terms, but it's a big deal. And what I want to talk to you about is the children's cry. And the children cry over there for several reasons. Number one is so much orphan happening. There's so many multiple births that women finally get a lazy uterus after the 10th or 11th or 12th or 14th delivery. The uterus cannot clamp down postpartum. And the number one cause of death in Kenya at this time, even 70 years after liberty from the colonialists and doing their own health system, of which they are very proud, the number one cause of death in sub-Sahara Africa, including Kenya, still is childbirth. That should not be a natural function, and if these women were able to deliver in a birthing center and have some Pitocin, Oxytocin, some treatment during the delivery, that should not happen. But there you hear of everybody running orphanages over there, both HIV and other kinds of orphanages. These are tragic. Uh, for instance, the last woman that I delivered just before coming back to the States in April, uh, she was 30 years old and was having her 10th baby. And with that kind of uh, grand multiparity, there's inevitable losses from postpartum hemorrhage. And then you have 10 orphans all of a sudden. So we need to get the birthing centers going much better. This is a grandmother attending her granddaughter who is delivering a baby through a pelvis which has been scarred down by female genital mutilation, which we will get to later. The mother has been pushing for about four hours. The pelvis will not give because it's all scar tissue instead of flexible connective tissue. I call this the Maasai prayer. She's actually looking up at the drip that's going into her daughter, which is helping us to regulate the contractions. And uh, I just love that shot. It looks to me like it's the real thing of the real people really praying to God for the real solution to these oppressive problems. Then there are volunteers that come over to these camps. This particular group of volunteers is from Florida Hospital out doing clinics in the bush, which is always interesting. They see several hundred people while they're there and stay at the camp that I'm speaking of. And in answer to the cry of the people for better deliveries, we have constructed in the last two years this birthing center. And when it came time to choose the delivery table, there was black and there was pink. And so what can you? You have to choose pink. And it works. You've got the, um, the, the, the table for the children to resuscitate. You've got a three-hour battery surgical light, and it goes very well. A wonderful crew of volunteers and staff, a couple of Maasai midwives in the foreground, a couple of volunteers in the back, and yours truly over there. Went there mainly to train midwives in bush obstetrics, having done that for many years. This is our chief, I call her Janet, the midwife in charge, and she is a tough cookie and wonderful person. She's able to do very excellent midwifery work here. She's carrying her own little baby in her own little tumbo in front, and now that baby is three months old, and uh, they've named him Godfrey, of all things. It's beautiful. Then we are a clinic and not a hospital, unable to do C-sections because we're not set up for a hospital that was an executive decision to not take it out of the clinic range, out of the birthing center, and put it up to a hospital that's way complex for what they can support there. So the executive decision was to not build an operating room and not recruit a full-time doctor, but instead get an ambulance because the closest place that you can do a section or an intervention is two hours away at best on a very bad dirt road. And when you call that hospital and say, we need an ambulance, they'll say, well, we don't have diesel, or the driver is incapacitated, or the ambulance is broken, or is out. I have seen it only one time in all my time out there that the ambulance actually came in a timely fashion and actually brought the patient back. So now we keep an ambulance and a driver on call. And this is the dedication of that beautiful vehicle. I just love the colors and the people and their friendliness. Up at the uh, right, right side of the picture is the pastor and the village chief as they are leaning down and everyone is praying, ululating and singing as we dedicate this ambulance to carry people who need transfer. 
Then you have the little kids coming in to get their vaccinations, their nutrition, and you have volunteers and the staff, and uh, it works very well. They have about 40 deliveries a month, something like that. This is Eva, and uh, she's going to school taking a BS degree in nursing now, but she is the one that goes out on the motorcycles, which I got for them to do village work. Of course, I love motorcycles, so it was a pleasure to get them a couple bikes. And we go out into the village looking for the patients that are having trouble. Either they're not showing up for their HIV medicine, or they've had a resuscitative event during the delivery going out and checking. But she epitomizes what's happening right now in Kenya. Mwai Kubaki, the president, made a deal with China. And you can buy this 150cc motorcycle and a jacket and a helmet and license and insurance for a whole year for $1,200 US. Unheard of. You can't find a deal like that in the States. They work well, taught her to ride, and now she's looking on her cell phone to figure out where this patient is. It's almost like Uber on a bike. It's fantastic. Yeah. She's a good person. Well, we found the baby. The baby had had about a one-hour resuscitation, being the second of two breech twins, and had plenty of resuscitation. We were worried about it. Went out and find the baby at one month, and here's the child and the midwife. This is in the darkened hut, light, natural light coming through the door of the hut, and the picture was just too good not to take. Looks like Madonna and child, doesn't it? And we would hope that every child would have a safe delivery and a good follow-up and a good chance, and the mother will survive. That's the big thing, is mother survive. Oh, yeah. Now, we're shifting gears to the other reason the children cry. We're going to have several today, and this is the second one. The second one is female genital mutilation, which has been going on for a long time, but was not in my frame of reference till the last two years. Before that, I'd been down in Malawi and Zambia and Rwanda and Tanzania, and it wasn't practiced there. We had a couple thousand deliveries per year in our midwifery school in Malamula and in Mwami, but we never saw this because it wasn't practiced by the local people. But the Maasai, the Samburu, the Somali, and the Poco are all similar in their Maasai-ness. They're parts of the Maasai tribe, and they practice it. Now, it's 100% in Egypt. It's 100% almost in Somalia, in Muslim countries. But the Maasai carry their own brand of female genital mutilation. Now, these are two people who have given the last 16 years of their life fighting this and have kind of slowed down for lack of a sponsor. I came along two years ago and treated Abigail and her son, who was sick at the time, at a clinic under the bush, into the trees. And we became friends. She took me across the plot to her husband, who is Steve here, and he's the headmaster of the little school there. In fact, he when he was uh, 26 years old, as a school teacher, was writing letters for girls to escape and go to a rescue center and actually wrote a letter for Abigail to escape. And she escaped the cutting. She's so happy about that. And she says, I stand as a preeminent example of that you can get married, you can have a baby, you can have a career without being circumcised. Now, circumcision should not be used in this context. It's a wrong word. We think of circumcision as a healthy procedure, and it is not in this situation. This is more a felonious sexual assault on a minor person leading directly into child marriage, early pregnancies, and a life of sexual servitude. That's what it is. And they have different styles of doing this uh, mutilation. It should be called mutilation and not circumcision. You go to a clinic and you'll see a sign up on there on the HIV clinic, get your circumcision today. Of course, it's talking to men. And in a man, it's a healthy thing. It t tends to prevent some STDs, tends to prevent HIV, and it doesn't really mutilate them at all. In fact, they don't even remove the prepuce in the Maasai cut, more like a cut on the side of the prepuce and the, and the glands poking through that, so they don't lose any tissue, actually. It's not really an impediment. Whereas the woman's is a clitorectomy, total, under no anesthetic and, and no antisepsis and no antibiotic, and then a labia minora ectomy, and then a labia majora ectomy, probably, and then the Somalis and some of the number three types of uh, mutilation then sew 
the vaginal opening closed down to a, a dime-sized opening large enough for menstrual flow and urine. But the, the old ladies that do this really don't know anatomy. And when they get going with that razor blade, the same razor blade they'll use on 15 or 20 girls, the girls in their stories, I have the stories here, I want to publish a book on their personal stories of either having passed through or not passed through or run away or what the sequence of uh, events afterwards are. They say that she cut on me like she had a revenge on my treasure. They call the clitoris their treasure, their sweetness, their prize, or the thing. They tried to revenge my clitoris. And it's horrific. They go way down, farther than necessary to get a clitoris off, and go down into the urethra oftentimes, constituting of scar tissue by and by and repetitive uh, urinary tract infections. But these two are a fresh drink of water in a desert. They have this beautiful smile of love. He's the headmaster at a primary school with 500 kids in it. And she is an FM, FGM fighter par excellence. She's extremely bright, then went on from escaping the cut at 16 years old, ran to a Catholic secondary school where somebody put her through, and then she went on to university and became a secondary teacher and teaches in the school we'll talk about later. Her name is Abigail, and he is Steve. Here she is in uh, teaching the students at the new secondary school, and here Steve is as headmaster of his primary school. This is one of their kids. <laughs> this, one. <laughs> this one's name is Gracious. My gracious. And the reason is that she was born when they were totally broke, penniless, and they said, oh, what can we call it but Gracious? In fact, Abigail, two days ago, delivered their fifth child having a tubal ligation, but they, they really produce beautiful kids. Here's the little boy. Shemmy. Now, what amazes me every time I go out and start working is that I find people that have been there, ready to do the work, well trained, well, what shall I say, they're really eager to do the work, waiting for some kind of sponsorship or some kind of encouragement. Now, this is an old man, and he is a village elder, very well respected, and he said, I refused to cut my own child and will do everything I can to stamp out FGM in my own district. Now, this was at a party, at a program where I was trying to revamp a school which had a couple of dormitories, two for girls and one for boys, and during intertribal inter fighting between the Kalenjin and the Maasai tribes on this border, they had shut the school and had pretty much abandoned the dormitories. And they've asked me to go over there and help rehabilitate that. So I was there rehabilitating those dormitories, putting mattresses on the bed, helping them to find food and all that stuff. And the village elders came in in order to have this meeting about rehabbing the school and about FGM. And what amazed me was I sent the women out of the room because we work with the women. That's easy to work with. But we have female teams to do that. But I said to the men, now look. I'm going to talk to you man to man, and I'm going to talk to you as a surgeon. And I outlined on the board the actual female anatomy. They didn't know that. They didn't even know the anatomical parts. And I explained to them how a clitoris is about like a penis with the same amount of sensation and pleasure for the female. And then they go and destroy that, and then they go and cut the lips. I showed that all. These old men, they have spears with them. They have clubs with them, and they're the toughest people you've ever met, and they have the kindest heart you'll ever meet. And they come to tears. You can see tears. And they say, Doc, we did not know. All this is done in secret, in a dark, dingy room, and even the women don't know what they lost. Amazing. So when you tell these old men, this is what's actually happened to your little girls, they become very, very touched. And at this particular meeting, with him kind of as a catalyst, and also the information, and telling them, you know, now it's against the law. It was okay and not against the law up until 2011. Then, Ilimo Kilimo got a law passed through Parliament, and she's a personal friend mentoring this project. She is a female member of Parliament, now retired. But, I say to the men, look, when you sell your girl or you trade your girl when she is 13 years old, you will get four cows and a couple of sheep and a couple of goats. Why not let her stay in school, get a degree? 
She will come back home and take care of you, hopefully, like a man going through school will never do because he goes off and does his own family. But the girl often has a fiduciary attitude toward her parents. You'll be way better off and try to appeal to their self-interest. Secondly, when the men come into the clinic with an STD, which they do a lot, there's a lot of HIV and chlamydia and gonorrhea and syphilis, all those things out there. I say to them, how come you're going out and finding a prostitute? They say, well, my wife is dead in bed. It's no fun at all. So I go out and have some fun and then I bring something home. And I say, you're killing your family. And the why she's dead? You destroyed the playground. You take away all of her pleasure, you oppress her, and you do it for purpose that she will not have fun and not seek anything on the outside. Now, when they were nomadic people, that may have worked a little bit, but to me it was always barbaric and cruel. But now they have been pushed out of the park. They want the park for game and for tourists, and they push the Maasais mainly out around the periphery. So now they're all in villages, and some of these practices, if they ever were useful, they certainly are not now. And I tell them, you know what's going to happen. The police are going to come. They're going to take away your cows. They're going to put you in jail. And when you kill a girl doing this, because many die during the bleeding because they won't go to the hospital until it's too late after they've cut them so deeply, then they're going to charge you with murder and put you in for 20 years. So rather than uh, depend on the police and the law and the army to come in and stop this abuse, let's do it through love. And I told them, it's like this. I'm not a smart guy, and I don't claim to know stuff, and I'm not a Western guy that um, really comes and says, I know what to do. But I do know this, that God's love, the creator of the universe, who loves you and especially loves your beautiful little 13-year-old girls, has told me not to scold you, not to be rough, not to be harsh, and not to threaten you but tell you about God's love and how together, through God's love, we can make precious our little girls and thereby not do this, have a better family life, have a better sex life, and have a much, much, much better delivery situation. I don't want to go much into the gory details of the delivery situation, but there's one girl that wrote in her letter, I was forced to be cut at 13, took me out of seventh grade and cut me. Next year I was married to somebody the age of my grandfather. Next year I'm in hospital pushing in the, in the, on the delivery table for eight hours and can't do it. Then she said, suddenly I cracked in four directions and the baby came out harshly. There's a lot of cerebral palsy, fistulas, all kinds of things which happened from these kinds of uh, scar tissues down there. And you know, even, even if the baby gets out, there's, there's still, that's going to heal only by scar tissue. It will never be flexible or else it will stay open and you'll have a leaking feces or a leaking urine. It's, it's pretty bad. And why it's not absolutely gone by now, I don't know. And then look at this girl. Perfect. Why cut? I like this one. Uncuttable, incredible me with the face of a Maasai warrior. She's on the team that's going out and doing what we call road shows or one day programs and also helping with the seminars that go on for four days of girls coming in for induction and uh, indoctrination and motherhood, agriculture, child care and making a certificate that the village elders by and by will accept as a transition into womanhood without the cut. And some of our t-shirts say, love them, don't cut them. Others say, FGM is a crime, stop it. And these girls, to come to four days of teaching, they want four things. They want a bar of soap. They've never had their own bar of soap, one of those big, long laundry soap bars. They want a box of Kotex or some kind of sanitary napkin. They've never had that. Many of them miss three and four days of school every month because of the bleeding uncontrollable and can't stop it. Then they want tea. They want tea, chai, between the sessions. And they want a printed t-shirt. Now that's about 20 bucks. And for about 20 bucks, we empower girls to say no and we go out and teach their parents about the whole thing also. 
And these four girls are 13 and 14 years old. have just arrived by transport to one of our seminars that's where we had 78 girls for a week. Who will protect us? Will the FGM snake bite us? They call it the snake. Will we be forced into illegal early marriage? I see the anxiety on their face. They're just totally concerned and well should be. Female genital mutilation, cutting, and child marriage. Now, this is a poster that was used up with the Maasai, the Rendili, the Poco, the Samburus, and the Somali communities in Kenya a couple years ago. They've got pretty good results where they're doing that. It happens to be that where we're working right now is recognized in the Narok County as being the least progressive in this area and the most primitive in their own words about stealing, doing the cutting. A couple of years ago, when we came into a village and were saying, you've got to stop the cutting, they did a revenge cutting, and they called in 40 girls, and they did it in public, on the square, in the market, just to flaunt, you're not going to tell us what to do. That's all changing. It's a wonderful thing that's happening. I'll tell you some about that in a little bit, what some of the big changes are. These are the elders that voted unanimously to stand and fight against and make disappear FG. This is on that line between the Kalenjins and the, and the uh, Maasai's. And they're at the school, and we've just had a meeting, and we're out talking about the next step. And each one of these are forming a committee in their village, these elders. They all stood in solidarity. We will make this stop in our area. I much prefer working with the men because here's the deal. You can get a girl to say, I don't want to cut. You can get the mother to say, I had a tough time in labor, but to the man, that's who it's being done for, is to control the woman. She hates sex by the time this is all over with. She says by her own testimony it hurts every time. And the only time she'll submit to it is by demand by the man that has a capability of demanding it. Then the delivery, I can't even imagine what that's like for them. So these guys got broken hearts, tasted the love of God, and say we are going to make this not happen for our beautiful little girls. This guy is the chairman of the school board there, and we're discussing how to re revamp the dormitories and make the school really go. It's, at the beginning of the year, it was under 200 people. Now it's climbing right towards 500. It's, it's, it's really blossoming. Uh, and um, certainly not my doing, but the fact is that you find seeds of light and truth wherever you go, and giving those a fan and giving those some support and some moral support and sending emails and telling them what a good job they're doing, and fight the fight with them, they take that very wonderfully. Now this man on the left is a World Vision employee, and he's teaching some of the people that have come to one of the seminars, and he is advocating against FGM. World Vision was really big in this 15, 20 years ago, and then they kind of went down, and uh, Abigail and Steve say that mainly in their opinion is that they were somewhat relying on outside people, but Steve and Abigail and the ones we're using now are what they call people of the soil, the real local people. It's just all local, very little outside influence. I act as a catalyst, if anything. Now, this is a very bright young school teacher who asks very probing questions. And uh, the women are here. And when we finish talking about some things, then the women go out and we stay with the village elders and the men who will finally make the decision. If they would say, we want wives that are not cut, the thing would die out, is my opinion. And that's who, what the opinion of everybody that's working on it. But it will go underground as long as, even if it's illegal, and they learn how tough it is on the girl and all that, but there's something in it which they just do. It's, I say, why do you do it? They say, well, we all did it. And when they cut the girl and she's bleeding onto the ground, they say, ah. The ancestors will enjoy this blood, blood sacrifice to the ancestors. Now, th this is a group of about 70-some that have been indoctrinated now for four days. We like to teach the little ones, the middle ones, and the big ones. The ones that are really at risk are the fourth, fifth, sixth, and seventh, and eighth graders who are about turning pubertal. Okay, I, I want to read this to you. You make it out the best you can, but then I want to show you the girls chanting it. We are the blossoms of our land. We are the cream of our generation. We are the future of our nation. We are intatapukwe. 
We are the, where are the ones who used to doubt us? Where are the ones who thought we were not worthy? That for us to be worthy, we must be cut. Let them come and see the daughters of Ma, the Maasai people. We are proud to be in Tigenemanungawa. We are proud to be blossoms of the Ma. When you come to find us, we will not be there. We shall not be found in the dingy, dirty huts. They are cut in a, in a darkened room out where they do the cow milking. It's very dark in there, and they take them into a dark room, do it in the dark, and then keep them in a dark room for two months or so with the legs bound together, because that's the only hemostasis they can organize besides pouring a little milk and a little cornmeal on the cut area. Then every time there's a number one or a number two call, got to unbind, go out, do your business, come back, get bound up, and wait for about two months. And about month number three, hopefully they will be married off to their prospective husbands and begin their child marriage and, and childbearing. Going on. We shall be doctors, engineers, and teachers. We shall stand side by side with the men. We shall be building our nation together. We are the blossoms of the Ma. I'm going to play this for you now with a group of about 15 girls. I have big groups of people doing it at these big things, but there's something to me very heartbreaking about this particular group of girls. You'll see why. Tapuka Emma, we are the uncut and proud to be so. I'm down to five minutes. I'm going to start moving along here. Now, to the men working in the same area. The middle guy there is named Julius. He's an Adventist elder in the Adventist church. The guy to his right is Samwa, and to his left is a game guard that comes up to make peace with the natives of the Maasai land when a lion comes and destroys their cattle. He's the peacemaker of the security people. These are hot shot people, well respected, and they are doing a great work. They're going out into the villages on motorcycles. All they ask for is a lunch and go out, and they say that things are going great. Here they are planning with Samoa in the middle. They're planning their strategy. A group of young Moran warriors who will have a big initiation August 13 through 18, with thousands of Maasai coming in. These are age groups that will be leaving the Moran warriors, and their new age group will be coming in, and now they will be graduated to be ready for wives. And we've been able to penetrate that group with these men who are, who are Moran warriors themselves, and these Moran warriors have pledged that they will stop this, and they will go to their elders and tell them, we want uncut women. Their rationale is they've tried both, and they like the uncut. Whatever the rationale is, I want them to put, throw their weight behind, behind uh, being uncut. They're wonderful people. Man, they can jump. It's hitting the news now. 23 circumcisers and parents are arrested. That was never on TV before this year. And it's, it's hitting the news. People are getting interested. There's always been an interest, but for, finally it's coming above ground, and it's time to strike and kill this snake. These are some of the girls that have come into the rehabbed dormitories, which are at the school that I was telling you about. And look at those faces. These are all very, very vulnerable girls. They're right at the age where they're prime picking for the uh, mutilation, if you can imagine. 
I have a bunch of stories here, which I was thinking of going through, but I think there's probably not time. What we probably should do is go to questions and answers and come back to this if there's time later. Would you come and help me with this, Fred? Yeah. Well, yeah, yeah. If, if anybody has a comment or a question, I'm not expert, I'm just a, what shall I say, a very fascinated witness and doing what I can through God's help and power to, to help this plague. Can, can I ask a question in general? Mm -hmm. Obviously, this is not the only negative thing against women in this part of Africa. How does the Adventist church feel towards women's rights and the way that women are protected, or should we not ask that at this uh, You church? can ask, but I don't have a very good answer. I remember when our house girl in Rwanda came beat by her husband and uh, we said, what about him? And we knew he's a church elder, and I was on the church board being a theologian and a doctor, and on the church board at, at Mugen Arrow Hospital, went to the church board and said, well, how come this guy is beating his wife? And the answer was, well, the wife is like a child, and the husband has got to discipline her and train her, and beating is part of that. So the answer simply is not very good. Not very good. I, I don't find much difference between the Christian doing this, these practices, the oppressive practices, and the non-Christians. It's kind of like in Rwanda when the genocide happened in 94, it was all Christians killing each other, you know? 94% of Rwanda was Christian, if you count Catholicism as Christian which they don't, they say, I say, are you a Christian? Oh no, I'm a Catholic. So that's nothing against that, but inside the church is not much different than outside the church. And so the work that I'm doing with these men has to do with Christians and those that love God doing much different and much better in taking away the oppression of women. And I think, I don't like to say it this way, but I think that's part of the magic of what's happening right now in that area, is that we're invoking God that loves the men, that they love their daughters and won't do this. I can't picture anybody destroying their own young 13-year-old pubertal daughter. As you see how beautiful and how nice and they are. And then their life is ruined forever. It's like a permanent disability from this, from this cut. Any questions? Or? Right here. Uh, perhaps someone can correct me, but I'm under the impression that our church does not take a position on mutilation, a concern that uh, <clears throat> if they do, it could interfere with baptizing. Does that make, it, well, it doesn't make any sense to me, but is that a reality or not? I halfway addressed that a moment ago. I don't think they're active in it. I think they're not. And they should be. If anybody should, be leading the way to loosen the bounds of the bound up, of freeing the captives, of bringing sight to the blind, of being the person that rescues us from the capture of Satan and his, <coughs> this has got to be Satan's dirtiest trick, to spoil a woman, spoil the sex life, spoil the family life, and then by and by destroy the woman by death by the early marriage because she'll have too many babies and die. It's, uh there's some cultural resistance to birth control. Do men feel like they're more potent? They, they can show their children and one factor. Well, you know, um, out in the developing world, in Zambia while working there, it was noted that a woman on average will have 16, if not 17, conceptions. Since malaria is such a potent abortogen, they'll probably have maybe 13 10 to 13 children, about half of those will die before five. So you're left with five or six kids maybe, half of whom are boys, half of whom are girls. And hopefully that's their only social security is somebody taking care of them in their old age from their progeny. And they say in Nairobi and other places, the best birth control method that there is is a Mercedes in the garage. You see those people, they practice, and they have two kids, and they send them off to university, off to UK, and they come back. 
But the people that don't have that and are uneducated and look at things traditionally where there's starvation and disease and no antibiotics and no surgery intervention, they see what the toll can be. And it's taking a long time to show that you can get kids to survive. Yeah. And so uh, children provide security for these people that are very poor? Yes. Okay. Yes, um, I'd like to point out that as far as the General Conference is concerned, more than 25 years ago, they produced a document decrying female genital mutilation and uh, stating very clearly that it is not a practice to be done. However, whether that has gotten to the African uh, conferences uh, is not clear to me. But that, that statement was produced by a, a, a group of the, from the General Conference more than 20 years ago. Probably very popular where it's not practiced. Probably. <laughs> I'd like to see that document because I never heard about it out yeah. there. Even at the church, I say, oh, what's the church's stance on that? And they say, oh, they won't say anything. Now, you can find it actually online uh, if you go to the General Conference and look up for uh, policies and recommendations. Thank you. This is no different, I think, than how Gilbert Burnham got fired down at Malamula for wanting to start teaching HIV. He had been there 16 years, built up Malamula up to a very high level of teaching. In fact, we use it now as one of our teaching spots for our own residents, not just their residents. And um, he lost his job over advocating for the prevention and the treatment of HIV by modern means. And the church says, our people don't do that. And he was erasing trouble, and he lost his job over it. Went to Johns Hopkins and been a professor there ever since. He's a classmate. So I don't think we take a very enlightened viewpoint many times, unfortunately. A uh, couple of things. Um, <clears throat> yeah, I know about Gil, too. I think he was passing out condoms, and this was encouraging yeah. promiscuity, exactly. according to the brethren. And uh, so he had to... God's people don't do that. No, right. Yeah. It's hard to explain, I guess, immaculate conception and all these babies. But, but uh, my, I had a couple of questions. One is you were distinguishing between the Maasai and the Muslim countries. So the Maasai are not Muslim, and their practice predates Islam in Africa? I mean, they, it goes... They, when I look at the history of mutilation, it looks like it does predate Muslim, but it has been taken into Muslim religion, although it is not in the Quran. And the prophet himself says you must not push women around. You must not abuse your women. But it's practiced 99% in Egypt and 95% in Somalia and everywhere that there's Muslim. It's very highly practiced. Uh, the other thing I was going to say, uh, we're Later in, uh, in the year, we're going to be discussing a book uh, about when religion becomes evil. And one of these is, uh, is an issue, and as some of you know, there are cases now in the United States. This is practiced probably half a million people right here. Uh, women are, have been cut to one degree or another, and uh, it's becoming a really hot legal issue because it... it that's makes a tension between religious liberty and um, diversity. Yeah. It's called diversity. But the fact is that it's happening in the refugee population coming from these places. And there are even people in our Congress now that will not condemn it. I just, I just saw a blurb yesterday about our representative from Somalia who will not condemn it. And there are even people who advocate for it saying that's part of who we are. A part of that goes to the issue of federalism and medical practice being regulated by states, not by the federal government. Exactly. But I think it's coming. I yeah. think the feds will step yeah. in. Well, there are 20 states now that don't have a law against it. There were 22 up till two months ago, and then two more have flipped over on it. So it's illegal. But they still can go to any other state and get it done if they want to do it. And they do it at a much younger age, many times at a year or two old, not usually at... Uh, you know, I think, I think the Michigan Supreme Court just overturned uh, a conviction against a woman who had uh, circumcised her daughter. So. Yeah. Uh, it's a hot issue because people want their own traditions and their own customs. And if, if it's that hard here, can you imagine what it's like doing out there, outside of the arena, arena of, of God's love, saying, 
let's be good to one another. Because even here with the police, it doesn't help. I was just going to say one other thing. Uh, after the, the overturning of that case, the woman physician who was involved uh, has not yet lost her license, although she's, the claims have been made to the Michigan uh, Medical Board. But the Michigan legislature, in its, to, to give it uh, its due, as soon as that case was over, passed a series of statutes outlawing that, uh, that procedure in that state. And I think as it comes to f comes to the fore, more states will do that. And if you go online and look up which states have an anti-FGM law, you'll be stunned about the number and, and who they are, those particular states. You might think that they are uneducated states or something, but it has nothing to do with that. It has to do with who lives there and where they're from and what, they're, and what they're, they bring with them. Yeah. Can I get her first? No. Donna, do you want to speak to California? I don't know. I don't know either. I don't know California. But I do have a list somewhere that I can find it. But you can too. You can look on the on Google and find which states do and don't have anti-FGM. Yes, sir. Yeah, I find it interesting that uh, our church has such a problem with issues related to sexuality one way or another. In Madagascar, where I spent <clears throat> 15 years of my life, we had absolutely no problem with telling our members that we don't do the turning of the dead, which is a practice over there where they take their dead out of the ground and dance with them three days, three nights. They call it the famadiana. And uh, we have taught the people that uh, the dead know not anything. So we have a clear theology regarding life and death. We do not have a theology of marriage, of sex, of genders, and as a result of it, we don't even know where to stand when it comes to abortion. And I find it very sad that we are so close to discussing these problems more openly. Mm. It's interesting when I was, I have a gang of four in Nairobi who are four young lawyers who are dedicating their lives to um, human trafficking. Every time I go, I spend lots of hours with them. One's in Mombasa now working in Matwaba, which is the worst, they say it's worse than Thailand as far as child trafficking. In fact, we didn't get to the next part, but they traffic children at five years old down in Matwaba, and the rescue is going on and the teaching and all that. But um, the human trafficking is big. We don't even know how big it is. In fact, we went on to some other pictures, I'd show you them coming out of that and coming into schools and even big people trying to learn enough ABCs and one, two, threes to go off to kindergarten, although they've been trafficked on their life ever, on the street ever since five years old. It's pretty bad, yeah. Is there another question here? Do we have time to go on? Yeah, I have one question, if I, if I may. Um, this really is not to do with the topic, but I find it, the, the young lady there with the cell phone, the motorcycle, yeah. do they have solar power in these villages where they're getting the ability to have lighting in the evening? You can buy for $90 a 100-watt solar power, and then you see them often up on grass roofs. So people are having solar power. They're having cell phones, they're having radios, and some are even getting little computers, tablets. It's becoming, jumping right into the 21st century. It's beautiful. I, I know the Rotary Club that I belong to, we've been buying uh, solar units for other parts of Africa. Yeah. Because once you get lighting in these huts at night, students can study. Yeah. And so that increases their uh, life expectancy, it increases their, their life right. ability. You know, um, you might say, why do primary schools need dormitories? But they do. And the reason is that if the boys and the girls walk home, the girl will be absolutely and instantly seconded into firewood, cooking, childcare, and household chores, while the little boy goes over and studies. So she doesn't have a chance. But if you get electricity going, and if you have dormitories, then they 
have an equality of chance and opportunity, and the girls have all come to the top of their classes in all the primary schools and all the secondary schools. I don't know if it's quite their eagerness that makes it happen, but not only is the dormitory good for study purposes, but over in this one that I'm helping to rehab right now, the marauding elephants all night scare the children from coming out of their huts and walking a couple miles to school each day, and they don't get there till way late in the day because the elephants are out marauding. It's a kind of like a pathway. And right on the edge of the park, the, the big game is a problem. You know, I like to motorcycle and do a lot, and they told me, Doc, I know you like that, but don't. The elephants are there and the lions are there. And I thought, well, I'm used to drunk drivers, but <laughs> this is something else. And it's real. Yeah, in fact, Abigail and Steve had their whole garden eaten by elephants, everything they had in the whole garden, and they looking for food. And they say, Doc, if you get us any one thing, please get us an electric fence. They have electric fences that are solar operated, and the elephant, as big as it is, it could walk right through it, but it won't because it touches it with its trunk. And it senses even the current before it gets there, and it will not go through an electric fence. So that's the first thing we're going to be doing around the re rehabilitated dormitories is putting in uh, electric fence. One strand or two is enough, but they put a lot of voltage through it, and, and it's uh, very, very effective. You get it right on your nose like an elephant. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay, why don't you do... Go on a little bit? I'd love to. I can... I didn't even get to the second part. That's embarrassing. Do we have to turn it on again? Did it go to sleep? No, I turned it off. This is my dear friend, Dr. Frederick Zercher. And uh, what a guy. I'm sorry. I thought we were done. <laughs> oh, did you shut me off? I shut it okay. off. Okay. Any more questions? No. I'll, I'll turn it back on. <laughs> How do we turn it back on? That's the question. Yeah. <laughs> anyway. I, I, that's what I thought. Uh -huh. There's a friend of mine who's going to present here soon, Kathy Mathis, PhD, who is the person that got the legislation passed through the Sacramento legislature for the, the bill against violence against women. And her field is violence against women and children and gender issues. And she's going to be presenting here pretty soon. Very fascinating. She's helping me with some of these ins and outs on how to work the. Uh, the um. It's coming. Eventually. Oh. oh boy. It's okay. Oh, go. Anyway, I did want to get through the second half. Let's. Look. Shall we just go fast if we get there? What time is it? It's now. 24 after, 22 after. You got six minutes? You got six oh, minutes. Oh, great. That's a lot. The, these are letters from the girls I was going to read to you. That's their own handwriting and their own grammatical stuff, and they just break your heart. I'll have some up here if you want to read some afterwards, but uh, this tells their experience. I really remember the day well. It was on Friday noon when I was going back to home from the shop. When I was walking majestically, don't you love it, majestically toward our home, I met with two girls of our neighborhood. Ouch, what's up? I spoke to the young girls as they told me that they were running away from FGM. What an amazement story it was. I just told them, stop crying. I will rescue their life. And it goes on from there how she rescues them. I can't get through them. I have to have somebody else read this if we're going to see these, because they, they break me out every time. I can't do it. But a book is going to be published of these because it's worthwhile. Can you make it go fast? I want to get through these and down to the um, children in the Wema Center. You may remember Paul Wangai. He's a Kenyan Kikuyu doctor, very bright, came here for his MPH after MD in, in Kenya. And he has helped to establish a under five trafficking child safe house in Mombasa, in Mombasa. Let's keep going. These are the villagers pledging. Oh, yeah, these girls that get trafficked and also the girls in school down there. There's a, a county named Kilifi County, which has about 1.2 million people in it. And in this year, 17 through 18, 17,000 
girls fell pregnant between the ages of 10 to 19. That means they drop out of school and their, their life is pretty much straightforward to a, a different destination at that point. Some of them are put out on the street by their parents, or some are trafficked, some are kidnapped, and some are lovers getting together. But few of it is lovers getting together. It's, uh, this kid is about five and he was trafficked on the street. <laughs> and now he's learning ABC and he's gonna change his life. He can stay here forever. We never put these kids back out to families or anything. They stay here once they get here. So we have kids going to college, high school, and grade school. But that smile, you can't, can't go by that. The lady there is Barbara. She's teaching all of these children who are uh, taken off the street from the trafficking. And she runs a wonderful classroom. If anybody would like to have a wonderful volunteer thing and go work with people that will really appreciate, really need, and really change their lives, if you would like to be a life changer, this is a place it can happen. This is the young lawyer who is uh, working on human trafficking. She's already passed her law exams. And besides being a lovely person, she's a recording artist. I have recordings of her. She's going to be big in the recording. And she wants to use her recordings in order to sponsor her, her uh, life work. But three nights a week, she's out preaching. And one night a week, she does prayer services most of the night. And anybody that's going to commit suicide, her friends call her, and she goes and ministers to suicide people and brings them back to sanity and uh, this fantastic person. Watch for the name, her name is Jolene. Here she is preaching and praying, which she does maybe three times every weekend besides working in the law office, in the courts, and the recording studio. Also gets involved in women's issues, menstruation matters, girls shouldn't feel ashamed about growing up and organizing marches. There's a group of school board members in Mombasa who she's instructing on gender issues and children's rights, lecturing. Now, to the uh, school which is being built at the place where I've just been working, at the clinic and uh, where the FGM work is going on, this is called Kensington Hall School, sponsored in money in materials by Kensington Tours out of Toronto, and the labor is done by volunteers that come to Marrow West uh, camp. That's where I stay when I go there. And these girls are the first class. We just opened it in January and now we're halfway through the first year. 50 girls in each class and each year we'll build another buildings for another form. We're starting with form one. And I was privileged to be there and help with that and get the desks and the books and uh, school salaries for teachers and and some of these girls who are not exactly run away, but very, very worthy. We're, we're, we're on the cusp of trying to decide whether to make this school a rescue school. And that's a big political issue. There are people that like rescue centers and other people that don't like them because once a girl runs away and comes to us, she's actually in your care from there on. The family will have nothing to do. So if they run away and come to a school, there better be some kind of support going on with sponsorships forever, up through college. And that's not very expensive. Like, um, well, I'm doing, can you turn yours off? Whoopee. Thank you. Um, it only costs about four and a half hundred per year to put a girl into school, boarding school, books, and uniforms. Uniforms are an expensive item, but it only costs under 500 for, per year to keep a girl in boarding school. And if they run away from their folks, she's going to need some kind of sponsorship. Now, at those camps I was showing you about, you saw those um, girls chanting. They're saying, when they come to find us, we will not be there when they want to cut us. Where are those that thought to be worthy, we must be cut? Let them come and see us now. We will be doctors and engineers and lawyers and teachers. And that's, that's, that's the focus that we're going towards. Educate, don't cut. <laughs> When I think of girls saying they will not go to the dingy, dirty hut where they cut us and steal our treasure, then you see this, where they're living it up, coming in very top. The Minister of Education from Kenya came out at the opening of this in January, and he said, it looks to us at the ministry that this could well turn out to be the number one secondary school in the country. And I think it probably will. It's, it's got fantastic teachers. It's got a lot of pizzazz behind it and power and love. Although it's a 
it's a um, government school, theoretically, and the government gets involved with the payment and so forth. They allow us to have free reign, free religion classes, spiritual work, prayers, Bible studies inside the school. So we need to take advantage of that now because who knows when that might end. Western Kenya on the Maasai Mara Reserve, Mara West is the camp. Kensington Hall. Kensington meaning the guy in Toronto who pays and it's being done here on, at, at Western Kenya, right on the game park re gate. The Western gate of the Maasai Mara game park. In fact, we look down on the river from where we are, and that's where the National Geographic photographers go to get the wildebeest jumping into the river and the crocs and all that stuff. That's right there. This is a, another building project at the same site, making a residential hall. Now this is the last, almost. This girl is 15. She's pregnant, seven months pregnant. She was married off at 14, and she has a dismal outlook. This, this picture just makes me cry. Her future is pretty much negative. She will become a milker of cows. A Maasai cow normally gives one cup of milk a day. Mm -hmm. One cup. But if you have 100 cows, you might get enough to put it in a can and sell it. So they call these sellers of milk, although there's very little milk involved. And that's her future. She got a bag of uh, pills for her prenatal visit, opposed to this. This girl's going to go somewhere. She's top in her class. Very bright, very nice, and a determined person. FGM, don't even think about it. I love that one. I want to make a bunch of posters. I've got pictures of these people and trying to make posters and books to get things going. This is Julius that I told you about before, and he wrote me a long letter telling me that, number one, they got into the Maasai warrior camp of the Morans, and they're coming across to be against mutilation. And secondly, here's the best news, that the circumcisers themselves are coming to us now, just last week for the first time, saying we hate what we do. We don't like to destroy these girls. We've been enlightened. We've learned how bad it really is. But it's our only way of making a living. Guess how much a circumciser gets for cutting a girl and destroying her future life? Guess what they might make? $5. 500 Kenya shillings. And she said, I don't want to do it anymore. And we say, oh, and so I sent back a message. I said, contract her. Get a contract going. Get her to sign that she will not do this. Start a training program so she becomes a village health teacher. Because she wants to join the team and go out and preach and teach and turn on the lights for people about how, how this really is. And she says she knows them all and will get them into a guild and they will all sign off on it. And even watch for people filling in that vacuum that will be created by them pulling out. So I think it's a step in the right direction. I'm sure it's fraught with pit holes, but potholes. And anyway, pray for us. We're trying to do God's will and uh, it's an exciting work. Here's Julius with his buddy overlooking the Maasai Mara. You see the riverine tree line there and that's where the National Geographic go. He's six foot seven. Quite a majestic guy, and he killed a lion in the day to become a Maasai adult. And now he says, I am looking for the backbone of that snake because I'm going to kill that snake just like I killed the lion through God's help. God bless you all. I wanna, I'll put a, a contact up here. These are the people that run the camp, and here's my contact if anybody would like information or anything else. There's last time some people wanted to make a contribution, and that would go to the Alumni Association in favor of the Nelson uh, Mission Fund. But if you want to come to that, I'll give you some more. Okay, and we as a class of, are making a donation yeah. of $1,000. Yeah, thank uh, you. If anybody wants to make individual donations, uh, obviously you're welcome to. And so uh, anyway, uh, Dr. Nelson, thank you. This really opens a part of the world that we are sheltered from so so we thank are you sheltered for that. that's for sure so uh, anyway next week dr brandstatter will be speaking to us and um, so let's just bow our heads thank you again that we can be here today father be with uh, dr nelson as he ministers to the the Maasai people and all those in that region and so watch over us be with our class we pray in your name amen
If anybody would like to be informed about what's happening, I brought a paper here. If anybody signs there, I would keep in touch with you. Okay. Happy Sabbath, all. What's longevity there, the life expectancy? Oh, about 50.